Welcome everyone to a new episode of Inkscope, the Inkscape podcast. Joining me today is a very special guest, one of my favourite artists of all time, the amazing Sven Ebert. Welcome Sven, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, hi Tim, uh, thanks for having me. got a few questions I'd like to ask you. To start with, who is Sven the person? Who are you in the real world when you're away from the internet? Uh, <laughs> I'm very tempted to give my regular answer to that question. Who is no, this no, person? No. It's like, usually I would say it's one of the most boring pe uh, people on the planet. <laughs> oh no, this, this is an in-depth exclusive interview. Come on, you, you've got to dig deep. Dig deep. Oh, dig deep. Dish, dish the dirt. Come on. <laughs> Well, um, right. where, where does where does Sven live in in the world? Where where do you hail from? Yeah, uh, I was born and have pretty much been living my whole life in Thuringia, Germany, which is in the former East Germany part of our country. So the the Russian controlled zone back in the days up until eighty nine ninety. Um, I was born here in 81, so I'm You're only a few months shy of 40 years old now. You're a youngster. Um, <laughs> well, well, it depends who you're talking to. <laughs> With nowadays, when I, um, which brings me to what I do for a living, which is uh, tutoring. I do, I work as a um, freelance tutor mostly in math mathematics with kids from i'll say fifth to tenth grade usually see, see when when you first told me that you did tutoring i immediately assumed that you would be an art tutor and it absolutely blew my mind that you teach math <laughs> yeah well this wasn't exactly planned when I uh, when I finished at university about a decade ago, after way too many years at university, but let's not get into that. <laughs> uh, when I graduated there, and, and I was thinking what to do with my life because what I was studying back then, which was, I'd say, a, a mix of economics and computer science, which was okay in, in in the beginning, but the longer it dragged on, the less fun I had with it. Yeah. And when I was finally done with it, I was feeling like, nah, I'm probably not going to work in this field. I'm not going to get happy in it. And so now the big question was, what am I going to do instead? And one day, my mom, who is a teacher in our school here, which is actually just about 20 meters this direction. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I had a really long uh, walk to school back in the day. <laughs> uh, I basically just fell out of bed and was in school. Um, yeah, my mom has been working there pretty much since we moved here to this little village. And this was in 89. Since then, we've been living here. I'm the oldest of three children, and I'm the only one who still lives in my parents' house. <laughs> It's my grandma at the ground floor, then it's my parents, then it's myself in the second upper floor. And yeah, my mom works at the school. And one day she asked me if I wanted to give it a try with the math tutoring because there was quite a bit of demand back in the day. I think it was in 2010 or 11, something like that. And yeah, there were a bunch of kids who had, let's say they had quite a bit of problems with mathematics, which isn't too surprising because it's like every, every pupil's favorite subject oh, yeah. in, in quotes, you know, yeah, don't talk to me about, <laughs> yeah, I absolutely failed maths. How is it? Yeah. I don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's that's no problem um i kind of like it i i never really had much of a problem with the subject in general 
uh, that's not to say that I didn't have problems as in uh, difficulties with it, but I didn't dislike the subject. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. And that's why she asked me if I wanted to give it a try. And I did try it out with, I think, three or four kids at first. So what, and, what age and, group did you say that was? Uh, from fifth to 10th grade, about, I'd say, 12 to 17, 18 years old, All right. roughly. Yeah, and over time, there were new kids joining in. Some were quitting. Yeah, it just keeps fluctuating, I guess you can say. Yeah, and that's what I've stuck with since then. I've been doing this for about a decade now. Ooh. Every awesome. now and then I get a call from a friend who whose family owns a, a household appliances store and sometimes I help out if they need a hand too. Yeah, but it's I don't have a regular day job. An eight hours a day job, so it's all just You've got to have time to do your art, man. You, you know. Yeah, you be, I guess you gotta so. be real. You gotta you gotta give time for the art. <laughs> and I need time. If if there's anything I need, it's time because I'm super slow with most things I do. It's oh, tell me about but, it. But but it's always been like that. <laughs> even even long before I, I even picked up Inkscape or something, I've been drawing on paper for many years, and it was the same with this as well. So I'm super slow. That's that's my problem. I but what's the rush? You know, it gets exactly. Down, it gets it's not my profession, so what's the rush? Like you said, yeah. I'll take whatever time I need, and I I don't really like to rush things because it's like um, I feel it's it doesn't really help anything. Yeah. If I had true. deadlines, yeah, I guess I would have to rush more and to rush more. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess I would have to speed things up a bit and probably would have to do certain things in a more efficient way than I actually do, but... I think there's always the, the, the worry then that the enjoyment goes out. Of it. Exactly. When, when, it, when it becomes confined by deadlines. Exactly. This, this is what I find when, when I've had to do yeah. uh, some stuff for uh, one of the local charities. I, I don't advertising posters for and they mm -hmm. say oh we need it in two weeks time and so all the fun goes out of it they, exactly it just becomes a burden and i i won't say i dislike doing it but i'm never i'm never satisfied with the final result mm -hmm. whereas yeah. when when i've got as long as i want you know you just you can throw yourself into it and yeah i don't i don't think i could ever be an artist it it works all time i think i would just end up hating hating doing it yeah it would kill it for me too and i guess mm -hmm. that's one of the main reasons why i never really thought about going into art as as a profession but you do you do sell some of your artwork don't you You've got a store yeah, yeah i do upload stuff for sale um yeah we'll put on, a link to, which, to that down yeah on, sure. so if anyone wants to yeah. so what so what sort of thing does your art get put on is it sort of like on um, bags and phone cases and that yeah sort of that and type thing they uh I, i'm i'm posting stuff on red bubble which i've been on since i don't know for quite a few years now and when I first created that account, they had like a bunch of different shirts with with a V-neck and a round neck and, and short sleeve and long sleeve. And and I'd say maybe, how many were there? Maybe 20 different types of clothing and a few other products. And over time, they've been adding more stuff like bags and pillows and other types of clothing like like pants and skirts and dresses and all sorts of household stuff floor mats for your bathroom and stuff like that shower curtains <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can definitely see some of your designs on, on t-shirts and i think that would be really cool 
I, I, I have, check that out. I'm sorry. Uh, I have been buying some of my own stuff for as presents for family. And um, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll give you my signs later. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that. No problem. Shh, don't tell everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been buying some pieces and they are pretty cool. Well, the quality, from what I can tell, I'm no expert with clothing manufacturing and stuff like that so take this with a grain of salt but it looked pretty cool to me and the quality was was good yeah. and yeah you always have to put some time into depending on what motive you just uploaded because not everything will fit nicely on every single article they have yeah. so this takes a bit of fiddling but yeah it's it's not that bad you basically just upload one image. It gets put on all the uh, the preview images for every single product. You can disable, enable every single thing. If you say, ah, this image doesn't work on, let's say, pants. Pants are always a problem for me yeah. because I've I've never had the feeling that it that an image looked really good on on pants. That's quite fiddly, but most of the other things, even just the default placement. Of your image it works in let's say 80 percent of the time hmm. and, and everything else that doesn't work well just disable the one product and that's it or just rearrange it scale it down or up a bit and and move it around and you're fine so do you have to do any sort of special color processing before you work or, or does the website take care of all that for you I don't really do any special treatment in that direction. I just uh, export my images as Ooh. standard PNG, upload it there. If it has a transparent background, otherwise I just uh, convert it to JPEG and upload this instead if it's just uh, a, a rectangular image. Ooh. Ooh. So hobbies. I mean, I suppose art probably is your main hobbies, but do you have any other hobbies that take up your time? Uh, a few, yes. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to catch my interest. I'm, I'm not really interested in a lot of things. And sometimes I think it's a shame because I never really sit down and really dig into something very deeply. I may just sit there and... oh and something catches my interest or it catches my eye on online and I would just sit there and read an article and that's it. And then I'm gone off to something else. It's, uh, there aren't really many things that I'm really deeply interested in. I've been drawing for many, many years now. Um, I, I have a plastic box over there that holds all my drawings since 97, I believe. Which which I usually consider uh, the point in time where I began taking the whole drawing thing more seriously. I mean, I have been drawing before, but it was always more like just casual scribbling. I guess every kid does that yeah. at some point, up to some point. And then some will just stick with it and others will let it go and look into other things. And I kept going with the drawing thing uh, I've been drawing with colored pencils for quite a few years and I didn't do anything else no no watercolor no nothing just colored pencil on paper on white paper that was all I was doing and but we are going to get back to the drawing thing again. So I just tick off the few other hobbies I have. <laughs> um, other than the arts, uh, the art stuff, I like reading, usually fantasy literature, and there mainly Terry Pratchett. I guess it's not oh, too surprising. Terry yeah, it's. I've got a whole shelf over there with. I believe by now it's something around 40 books or something. Oh, wow. I've got all the digital books, um, but okay. I would love to have the, the actual hardback yeah. editions. Yeah. 
I think I, I from the from the disc world main novels I I think I have everything that was released and in addition some some other stuff some there were some comic books and art books oh, wow. I've got a few of these too I've got a, a a larger format art book which is fantastic but I have to admit I I think I haven't even really looked into it in detail yet I've been having this for years, but uh, that's a very bad habit. I keep buying books and especially comic books with small issue comics and they just keep stacking up without me working off the stack. So it just keeps piling up and new stuff comes in when I haven't even read the uh, what's there already. Yeah, anyway. So yeah, comic books, I like comic books. Not so much the the mainstream U.S. superhero comics. I like more. I'm more into some uh, European fantasy. I guess you could say some of these are more geared towards younger readers. I like Monster Allergy, for uh, for example. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. Silage, which is a, a French comic. Oh, I didn't know that one. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool, and it's been around for quite some time. Uh, it's science fiction All right. with a female main character. Yeah, I would recommend it if you're not opposed to European comics in general. No, no, you'll have yeah. to give me the link for that. I'll definitely that. Yeah, I, I can do that, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and some some other stuff. Not like I said, not the the very well known mainstream popular stuff. More smaller uh, series, not not the super long running ones. And yeah, I like that. And I guess last but not least, I have to mention video games. I'm not a I'm not a very good gamer. I wouldn't even say I'm a typical gamer in general uh, uh, in the sense that the word is used nowadays. I'm a gamer. I'm not like that. I mean, I like playing video games. I've been playing for many years now, but it's not like I'm doing this for the challenge or to get on high score lists and to do achievements and stuff like that. It's It's not like that for me. It's just casual, just mainly just experiencing the story looking at the art if there's something to look at yeah. not not every game is really that artsy i guess so what sort of games are you in uh i'm not really into one single genre i guess it depends on the game I've I've had phases where I like to play racing games. I I've had a, a phase where I love playing uh, big RPGs. I like action adventures. I like hack and slash games. I guess I would be. It would be faster to just name the genres that I don't like, which is basically just uh, simulation games. I'm not really much into that kind of stuff, like military vehicles and and airplanes and stuff like that or yeah. or uh, um, management games I hate stuff like that yeah no I'm no good at stuff they are they always or they often feel like uh, just looking at the images and seeing huge tables with filled with numbers and stuff and it feels like hey man this is work this is not <laughs> This is not something I do for my entertainment and for, yeah, I don't know, in my free time. Yeah, but I'm not really uh, sticking with one genre. So do you, do you go into the whole online gaming, competing against other people? Not, not yeah. at all. I've yeah. never been into competition. Not in 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 school, in, in PE class or something. I've never been the competitive type not in sports not in gaming not anywhere i i don't really like competitions and stuff it's like i mean i get why people do this but it's just not for me <laughs> no it's, it's not my 
you know, I, I like playing games, I like playing uh, console games, but not against people online, basically because I'm rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's that too. I I like playing games, but like I said, I'm not very good at it, and I don't, uh, I don't feel like putting or investing the time it would take to get really good at a certain game. And then there's also if you want to get good, get good at one game, you probably have to spend so much time that there is no time for playing other games. Or if you play, let's say you're playing two kinds of games uh the same kind of game but two different games let's say two fighting games i've heard that from people who said i'm not going to play street fighter because i'm good at let's say tekken and it's probably rubbish what i'm saying right now but uh, i think the idea would still come across where the two different games play differently they have different play styles and if you're good at one game you don't play the other one because it would just screw up your skills with this one game because it plays differently and you're maybe getting things mixed up in your brain or something and yeah i don't know like i said it's not competition is not for me and i've got a good protection against online gaming which is my offline computer because i only play on that machine <laughs> so there isn't even any temptation to go online it just will never connect this computer to the internet so there's no way to for me to play online so let's go on to inkscape so how and when did you first hear about escape uh yeah i've been thinking about this when exactly it was and i can't really pinpoint an exact date but i believe it was in 2009 or maybe 2010 at the latest. And how I got introduced to it was uh, by, what was his name? Oh, that's embarrassing that I forgot. I should have thought about this early. Oh, I think his, his username was Micro Ugly. And he did run the, the unofficial official Inkscape forum. <laughs> the one that that went away some time ago and was then replaced by the official official one and and uh i knew him from deviant art which was i think one of the first sites where i ever posted some of my works since the early 2000s yeah anyway um i got freehand mx from a friend around the same time and had been doing like a handful of pieces with it which was actually the first digital works that i've ever done just like four or five pieces done in freehand mx and one day he he asked me if i had heard of inkscape and if not i should probably give it a try so that's how I first heard of it. I hadn't really looked into any any art programs because it was at that time it wasn't really of much interest to me. Because like I like I said earlier, uh, I've been drawing on paper exclusively for yeah. years, and I was pretty happy with it. But yeah, I uh, I looked into it. I downloaded it, tried it out, which was I think around version. Which version was it? That would have been about uh, uh, 0.45. I was going to say 48, uh, but, I, but I think it was, back then it was, may, may still have been in the 30, uh, 30, some 36 or so. Uh, it's it's hard to to remember all these years, all the versions that have come, uh, that have come and gone. So yeah. What was, that, what was that early experience with Inkscape like? Was it? Did you find it intuitive? Was it a bit hard to understand? What, what was it like coming from the traditional background and going into digital for the first time? What was that like? Um, it felt a lot like FreeMDMX before, 
I had also tried out Illustrator. I got a version of Illustrator from my friend too. <coughs> it, it fell off a truck. <laughs> uh, but I only tried it out very briefly because uh, I think it was something about the way that the whole path drawing and node manipulation fe felt it was different from Freehand MX and I liked the way Freehand MX felt. And so Illustrator felt off to me. I think this was the main reason why I didn't really invest more time in, in this one. And then he suggested I try out Inkscape. I did, and it felt pretty much like Freehand did before, which was totally fine with me. And so I just stuck with it. Uh, I, I can't really say if I found it intuitive. I guess I didn't really have any major gripe with it. Not that I can remember. It was, it was all right. Worked for me. And and I didn't really try to to imitate the look of my uh, of my pencil drawings. So I, I've always considered these two separate things. I mean of course I'm most of the time I'm working from the same type of sketch that I did that I still usually do on paper. Um but other than that it's a completely different thing. I'm going for an entirely different look. I'm not trying to uh, to imitate the pencil texture or something. It's yeah. just two different things. I think you can definitely see influence of traditional art in the drawings. You can see that you, you come from that background. You've not just started in digital. You can see that influence heavily artwork. I can in. <laughs> So, young people coming into Inkscape, what sort of advice would you give to a young person who wants to start out in art or graphics type work, whether that be as a hobby or professionally? What would you, what advice would you give to someone? Um, since I'm not doing this as a professional myself, I, I feel like I shouldn't really give advice to somebody who says, oh, this is my, my major goal to make this my profession. Because I'm always looking at this whole drawing and art thing like I, it's just something I want to do. And like I said earlier, um, I don't really care much about being super efficient so I, I think or I feel that I'm not really in a position to give that kind of professional advice because it works differently for me than it would for somebody who wants to earn his, his yeah, bread and butter with enough. it. Yeah, definitely. So um, um, in regards to Inkscape then, someone coming to Inkscape for the first time, um, no background in digital art, what, what would be your recommendation? How would you suggest they start? That is simple. I would just tell them, and I've told people <laughs> uh, more than once, um, to just sit down in front of their screen, fire the program up, and spend, let's say, an hour or two hours just clicking every button that is there. Just try out all the basic tools that are available. Try to familiarize yourself with what's there, with the tools at hand to get a grip of um, what tools are there, what options do these tools have, what can I do with these options. Because Oftentimes, people come in and ask this question, well, how do I get started? What shall I watch? What shall I do? And people are always so fast to recommend this YouTube channel or that YouTube channel. And it's like, yeah, well, I don't think that this is always the best way to get started with something. I guess it makes sense for certain things, but it's not like this is the one and only way to go, in my opinion, anyway. No, and I, I feel it's okay if you want to learn a specific way of doing something, but to just learn the tool itself, 
like you said, just click around, find out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would agree. And and from from the posts that people, uh, from the posts that people post, yeah, <laughs> uh, from the comments people drop and the questions they ask, ask, I often get the feeling that some of them haven't even started the program once, but they already ask for tutorial videos. And I think this is the wrong way to approaching it. If you don't know which tools are there in the first place, you're going to struggle with any video trying to understand what they are doing if they don't explain every single step yeah. in detail. And I guess uh, this is really just me guessing because I haven't really watched many tutorial videos. I don't have the patience for this, not uh, regarding Inkscape anyway. With other programs, this might be different. Yeah, but... Um, if I don't know which tools are there, how can I know how to do a certain thing? How do I know, how can I draw this? How can I do that effect? If I don't know which tools are available to me. Yeah. I, I guess it, it's just common sense to familiarize yourself with the tools of the trade, whatever that trade may be. Yeah. If I don't know how to use a hammer and a nail, I probably end up just smacking myself on the thumb with the hammer. Or maybe I would just knock a hole in the wall or something. I, ha I have to familiarize myself with the hammer. How does how much does it weigh? What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? I, I guess a hammer is a very simple tool and there aren't that many appliances for it. So you hit something with it. All right. Maybe that wasn't the best example, but still you have to get an idea what the tool is and how it works, how it behaves. Yeah, so that's absolutely. that's basically my main advice I would give to somebody who is really new, who's really just starting out using the program. Yeah, I, I would Try. totally agree, absolutely. So, and, yeah. and one more thing, there isn't, there's no magic button. Don't expect to do awesome artwork right from the start. You will have, you are going to have to go through practice you have to try out things you have to do you have to apply whatever you saw in this in this video or read in that article if you never really put it to use yourself how are you going to to be able to use it yeah. in a in a meaningful way yeah definitely yeah I and think that the, i think the phrase is fail quicker than that is uh, <laughs> fail many times to succeed Fail quicker. I like that one. <laughs> that's that's not mine. That that's, I can't remember who said it, but it's a famous artist said it. Fail quicker. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, and, and and quickly going back to the question: Is it intuitive? Uh, I guess some people would say it is. Others would say it isn't. In my opinion, it's easy enough to get started without any outside help. Like I said, you can you can just pick the pen tool and start clicking around and you will see things happen. You just start by click, 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 placing a few nodes with straight line segments between them. And then if you click on the starting node again, you've got a filled shape. And that's that. And then you, at some point, you will click on the next button in, in, the, uh, in the toolbar. And then work your way through, and it will also tell you in in the bottom line, uh, in in the in the info line at the bottom, it will tell you you can use Shift or Control or Alt to do this or that. Yeah. It will give you little hints along the way without you having to read through uh, pages and pages of manual or something. Although there is a manual and there are inbuilt tutorials that will give you a good idea of many of the uh, basic functionality. Yeah, if you go into the help menu. Ex yeah, yeah, exactly. They're there, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, that's excellent. So speaking of you then, what is your all-time favorite feature or tool in Escape, past or present? Uh... 
It doesn't have to be one. It can be a couple. To be honest, I use a handful of the most basic tools most of the time. Like 90%, 95% of my stuff is done with the pen tool and the node tool. And that's what I'm using all the time, just putting together the shape with straight lines, like I just said. I, I don't like the click and drag thing where it immediately Roll. gives you a curved line. This has always been confusing to me. Yeah, that's, I, I, that's very much an Adobe Illustrator sort of scenario. I, I never really, no. really looked into it because it has been confusing me from the first time I ever tried it out. So I just go click, 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 straight lines and yeah. then bend them in the shape that I want exactly. yeah. with the note tool. Uh, so these ones I use a lot. I use the, the gradient tool, yeah. although probably not in the way that it's meant to be used nowadays with the on canvas editing and i mainly just selected to to pick one of the gradient definitions in the little drop down box at a at the top in the tool settings bar because i'm always using a, a fixed color palette so to speak where i have just a bunch of color definitions or gradient definitions and everything in the entire image uses these colors which is also another feature i really like which is the auto palette yeah yeah which now, i didn't know that existed until you told me about that one day and it, it's amazing i i just found it by accident actually many years ago um when I was just going through the included palettes and I was wondering what is what does auto mean? And at first, if you click it, it would just give you an empty color palette with just the red, red X yeah, like that, yeah. That, yeah. that you use to remove the color. And there's nothing in it. And that's one of the things that I had to look up because I didn't know what to do with it. Other than that, most of the things I'm doing with Inkscape, most of the stuff I've just figured out by trial and error, which is pretty much my preferred method to learn. This program, at yeah. least, would be a different thing if we were talking about Blender. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is really something where I feel uh, quite overwhelmed by the interface and all the buttons and things you can do when it throws at you. It's it's so much more complex than what Inkscape has on screen if the first time you, you fire it up. And that's why I feel if I can figure out Inkscape, pretty much everybody else should be able to because so, I'm so I'm sure. not I'm not that much <laughs> smarter than everybody else, right? Um yeah but so the other palette is something I've been using almost from the very beginning. I used to use uh, some some fixed palette on a few of my very early pieces, I believe. But as soon as I found the auto palette, that's just, just what I've been using. I set up a default document for myself where I have a bunch of gradient definitions already added to the palette stuff like i'm using in pretty much every single piece which is the the gradients i use for shading uh, one or two gradients i use for highlight stuff and i believe the skin and the hair color i even have named these definitions they have an id uh, a, a speaking id so to, so to speak it says C underscore skin, for instance, which just uh, which is just an ID that tells me it's C for color, and it's the color I use for skin. Since I'm using, uh, since I'm drawing mainly characters, that's something I need all the time. And then whenever I start, I want to start a new piece, I just use that default template, and just keep uh, adjusting the colors whatever way I, I need them and adding stuff to the color palette as well which uh, i guess is kind of 
a weird way I'm doing this because I don't really use the, the fill and stroke dialog much, which you would usually use to add new colors to this, to the other palette. There's a button that says add swatch or something, yeah. I believe. And I guess this is the usual way of adding stuff to this color palette. I, but I have the, the XML editor open all the time and I just go into the dev section and clone or duplicate one of the entries that are already there, uh, update the ID so it tells me what I'm using this color for. Then I save the document and reload it so that it updates the color palette at the bottom, which is, yeah, like I said, it's it's a weird way of doing this, but... Yeah, I'm doing a bunch of weird things so, with the XML I, editor. I know you use the XML editor a lot, don't you? How did you get into that? Because to me, that's so alien. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you do any sort of um, development coding or anything like that to understand all that gobbledygook that's in there? Because it's just completely alien to me. Uh, the stuff that is exposed to you in the XML editor isn't, well, in my opinion, it's not that alien. It's actually human readable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're all right. Not uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Well, uh, I I have some programming experience. There you I go. Did, I, did, I did have programming courses at university and... I actually wasn't that great at it back in the day, but I also did some some game programming as a hobby in the early 2000s, some, I think around 2003 to eight or nine, something like that, a couple of years, where I used to work on a bunch of little game projects, none of which was ever really finished. Uh, but that's a different story. Uh, yeah, but the, that that's where I got some experience with programming in general. Nothing too uh, too elaborate, I guess. Although, I I also did a, a game project for my diploma thesis, right. which was a little two D side scrolling platformer. That oh, was yes you've, yes, you've shown me that. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, uh, under the hood, this one was actually quite complex, even though it was just a little side scroller. So, if people out there nowadays, where there's tools like Unity and whatever else they are using nowadays, they take so much out of your hands where you don't have to to bother with every single detail. And even back then when I was doing this stuff, it, it wasn't really like I had to do everything manually, not not in a, uh, not at all. I was, for my hobby projects, I was mainly using Game Maker, which is, let's just say it, it, it's an all-in-one package where you just throw in your, your graphics assets in your sound effects and your music, whatever you want to use. And you can do most things via drag and drop where you just uh, drag in different symbols for, uh, for different things to happen on screen, basically. But you can also really write code. And I used to write code for pretty much anything that I wanted to do because with all the drag and drop, it's it's nice for uh, for people who are just beginning with this kind of uh, stuff, but it's also, <clears throat> it also limits you in a way where um, you don't have all the, you don't have the power that you have when you write your own code. Yeah. Basically, I'm saying, yeah, I don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally that's, understand. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, but but actually, I'm not really that much a tech geek. It's just this uh, this programming stuff. Uh, I guess the reason why this worked for me while the programming at university didn't work too well was because at university what do you program you 
maybe you program a little calculator program or something or other, th uh, uh, other stuff that just prints stuff on screen, text, basically text yeah. or maybe tables or something. But this is pretty boring, to be honest. <laughs> well, to me, it was pretty boring. I guess uh, if you're really a programmer by heart, even this kind of stuff will give you some sort of satisfaction, I guess. But to me, it was pretty boring. But the the game stuff, you just put images on screen. You you um, put little animations on screen. You you push a button and your little guy starts running and shooting and, and jumping around. And this was so much more fun. And uh, that's why I kept going with this where I never would have gotten this far as far as I got with the game programming stuff. I would never have made it this far with the the regular programming, the just plain application stuff. Uh, we got a little sidetracked here. We did, we did. That's excellent. So where, do, where did I leave the, the trail? Uh, we were talking about your favorite tool or feature. Right, the XML editor. Um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what do you use it for? I use it for stuff like, well, what I said, the, the color palette management where I rearrange color order, which doesn't, I think, doesn't really work if you want to do it if you want to just drag colors around in, in the palette, it may be possible and I just haven't found a way. Or or uh, it's always a, been there and I've, I've, and I've never <laughs> noticed. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, uh, I use the, the XML editor for this to add new colors by duplicating existing ones and then just adjusting these duplicates. I use it to select things that aren't selectable normally for instance layers there is a way to select the layer as a whole which is by turning it into a group into a regular group with the the objects window oh, right you can you can switch between group and layer mode for every single group there is uh, layers basically are just groups that have a single property that tells Inkscape this is a layer and not a group. And only those groups that have this special property show up in the layer editor. Um, so if I want to apply a filter maybe, which I like to do for stuff like backgrounds to put them, to make them blurry so as if they were out of focus or something, I usually like to do this by just slapping a, a blur filter on the entire background layer. And usually this wouldn't be possible or it wasn't possible before the introduction of the objects window. But you could do this with the XML editor, which fun fact in version 1.0 it's not possible anymore, I believe. Oh. It, it, it doesn't select the layer. I think we tried this out uh, at one of our previous conversations. And, yeah, we had to do a funny and, workaround if I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's where I found out, oh, right, at least it does still work if you turn the layer into a group apply your filter and, and turn it back into a layer if i'm not i'm not a real uh, not a big fan of groups because i uh, i find it kind of tedious to have to double click all the time to get into the group or select yeah. right click enter group and this is just too confusing and too annoying yeah, to and me if, you, if you've got a very busy uh, image it, it can be quite difficult to yeah to get into. exactly yeah. Es especially if you have groups inside groups Exactly, yeah, yeah. And well, also... One of the um, the biggest things that blew my mind with the XML editor was when you showed me how to clone the canvas. Yeah, that, that was, that's one that of the crazy. things... That's one of the earliest things I did with it, yeah. where, I, where I used the XML editor, editor to basically just clone 
the the topmost layer that contained everything else from the drawing the the line layer and uh, the basic colors and the shading and everything yeah. and then i just flipped it around because i've uh, uh, i've i've always said uh, i've always had this little problem even back in the day when i was just drawing on paper where i i noticed at some point if i look at the image flipped around in a horizontal direction if i look at it mirrored in a mirror or if i just hold the paper up against the light and i see it from the back side and i see it flipped around and i would notice certain flaws in in, in shapes where yeah. something looked off or the face which was supposed to be symmetrical wasn't symmetrical at all if i looked yeah. at it from the other side and i was just looking for a way to basically have have a mirrored copy of the actual image next to the actual image so i can spot such flaws early on and that's also why uh, if you've seen some of my uh, screenshots from inkscape that i often post with whenever i finish something and, and post it online i often add a screenshot in in outline mode yeah. but it also it often shows a mirrored copy of the image right next to the actual image and that's what this is for yeah. just it's just a little help for me to spot certain mirror uh, mirrors certain mistakes that i made or something that looks off but it, which i wouldn't notice when i've been looking at the same image for hours and hours yeah, you I just think, overlook certain flaws and this can help to spot these things. Yeah, I think that outline mode that you do where you sort of blend part of the mm. picture is normal and then it fades into an outline. Mm. I think that was one of the inspirations for the X-ray view that is now in mm -hmm. 1.0. I think um, Javier was uh, really taken aback by how you did that and, and that inspired him to work on that. And that is an awesome feature. So that was down to you. Excellent. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a feature I haven't really used much. Uh, no, I think I haven't really used it at all yet because I'm still on version 92.4. Yeah. So that's a nice little segue into our final. If, uh, let's pretend that Escape had a fantastic R&D budget with paid developers, uh, what feature or tool, features or tools, would you like to see in Inkscape? Why? Come on, anything you like, what would you like? <laughs> something you've seen somewhere else or something that you would like to put in personally, but don't have the ability to do? Um, this is also a pretty hard question for me because something I have seen somewhere else, this doesn't really apply to me because I don't use a lot of different programs. I use some, I use two different programs for pixel art, which I also do every now and then. And it's really just mainly Inkscape for me. And I use a rest up graphics program to just uh, prepare stuff for, for the web, which comes out of Inkscape. So there isn't really much where much opportunity for me to see certain features that I would want to be included into Inkscape. Um, I guess my main gripe with it is the performance where it, it at some point it will just slow down and the screen updates will be will become sluggish that's the main issue i have with it otherwise since i'm just using the the most basic tools anyway i'm pretty happy with it <laughs> that's fair enough fair enough uh, so where can people find you on social media Where's, where's the best place to track you down? Well, my main my main website is my blog on WordPress. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll I, I, yeah, exactly. I guess that makes more sense. Um, otherwise, I'm on DeviantArt. I have a Fur Affinity account, although I'm not very active there anymore. Uh, it's most of the of the websites where I have an account. I go by the name of Dillakind. We can just put this in the description too. Yeah. Uh, I have an Instagram account, which is also Dillakind. This has well, been you should, my... you should know that it's your. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing is, I'm using different names, but uh, the Dillakin isn't exactly what I consider my my artist name, which is the Ace Ventura, uh, which I usually put in, in the signature in my images. Yeah. That's what I've been using for many years now as my, basically, yeah, my artist name, which is which originally was just a, a silly wordplay with Ace Ventura, the... Uh, Animal detective, I believe he is. Um, And the Dillakind has become more or less my just my my user account name on all sorts of websites. Yeah, my my Facebook page. I don't really have a a a separate Facebook page. It's just my my regular personal account. But I'm rarely posting anything else but my my finished artworks there. So this is basically my Facebook art account uh, I've got a red bubble account which we were talking about earlier where I sell well I try to sell stuff there and that's pretty much it yeah excellent brilliant so, thanks very much for taking part Ben I know this has been uh something that you're not very comfortable with normally, but I do appreciate you being the guinea pig and taking part on this uh, this first type of episode for us. So thanks very much. I hope everyone out there has enjoyed this uh, somewhat different episode of Inkscope. And um, if you've got any suggestions, put them in the comments below. And remember, whenever you draw, draw freely. Exactly. Do as this man said. (laughs) Bye, everyone. Bye.